Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Today's guest is new to the program. He's an expert on everything Cobalt. He's a non-executive advisor to Cobalt 27, a company we've spoken about here on the program before. Nick French is on the program with us today. Nick, welcome to the program. Colin, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to discussing a little bit about Cobalt. Yeah, I think it would be great, Nick, if you could start off with a bit of background on yourself. You have very impressive background as it goes in a very specific commodity being cobalt. Um, I think the, the short answer is just longevity. I've been in it for about 40 years following cobalt and a number of other metals, strictly on the trading front rather than the technical or battery front. But uh, one of the reasons I'm still in it, even though um, the time has come to retire, is I'd like to really watch what I think is going to be one of the most interesting phases of cobalt pan out, because I don't think I've ever seen anything uh, on the track as interesting as we have at the moment. Nick, we held a discussion last week to get acquainted and yeah. also to talk about some of the topics that we would go over today. Um, I want to I try to get a comprehensive overview of the cobalt market in a short period of time. Maybe a good place to start is, what are the overall difficulties with cobalt? Cobalt is a small market, and it's hard to produce more of it. Yes, I think the, the key issue here is that it's a byproduct. Uh, nowhere in the world, actually with one exception of 1% of the world's production, but essentially nowhere in the world is cobalt dug up and produced and refined simply for itself. It comes out as a byproduct either of copper mining or nickel mining. And therefore, the issue we face today with the increasing demand that we're going to talk about for the electric vehicle batteries is that even though the demand is growing, the supply can't uh, adjust to that straight away simply because nobody at the moment is going to be producing more copper or more nickel. Uh, so given that case, uh, it means that the 100,000 ton a year current production cannot be increased uh, easily to meet the demand that will be required by, let's say, 2025 of possibly twice as much as we need today, which is to say 200,000. So I think the first category is, is the byproduct element. The second element, which makes it doubly sensitive, is essentially the, uh, the axis of supply and demand. Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, produces about 65% of the world's cobalt at the moment. And equally, 60% of the world's cobalt is consumed in China. So they really rule the roost, and the rest of us are just dancing around the edges of that. Uh, both those areas, obviously, are, in terms of China, uh, growing rapidly, and in terms of Africa, unpredictable and uh, unstable. So that makes for a pretty interesting, uh, interesting pot. Nick, everybody knows that the Congo is an unstable jurisdiction compared to many other mining jurisdictions, and there's been a lot of talk as the cobalt story has emerged about what that could mean in terms of threat of current supply. Have you seen anything that would lead you to believe that that supply of the 65% could be threatened in any way in the future? I, I, I wouldn't go so far to think it's going to be in any way politically driven by some dramatic revolution or civil war or anything else like that. Like obviously, one can't exclude that. But that's not, I think, what the shortage of cobalt is predicated on. I think as far as Congo is concerned, there are the normal logistic production uh, challenges, electricity, transport, um, equipment. Uh, it is a difficult corner of the world to, to work with logistically. And if you look at Glencore, for example, who the world's largest uh, trader, producer, and handler of cobalt, they themselves have a couple of mines in Congo, and they announced, for example, last week that their quarterly production of cobalt is down 14% over the previous quarter, and that's caused simply by the logistical challenge of getting enough electricity at the time, enough power. So Congo has plenty of production problems uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You already mentioned that cobalt is a byproduct of nickel and copper in existing mm. supply. Is there any development projects or even pre-development projects that would be a primary source of cobalt and would be meaningful in the market? Uh, the, the important words you used was meaningful. I, I can give you a couple of names in a moment of those that would purport to be primarily uh, cobalt producers still uh, being worked on. But before we do, let's just exclude one possibility. One of the questions somebody might ask is, uh, is there any? If, is there a price which cobalt could reach? It's currently, by the way, about thirty dollars a pound. Is there a price that cobalt could reach where it would be worth uh, developing, putting up the capex, the investment for a copper or a nickel mine, in order to get the cobalt out of it? Uh, we don't have time on this program to go in detail, but I can refer you to the recent report from Bernstein Investment Bank, who produced a very comprehensive study of the figures and show that even if cobalt went to a hundred dollars a pound, uh, 
it would not under any circumstance justify you know the five billion six billion uh, capex required to open up a copper or a nickel project so on price alone we can't promote any further cobalt production in terms of existing projects that uh, might uh, produce a few tons and as i say the the question you raised was meaningful tonnages you have um uh, e-cobalt in in the usa who have been on on the uh working on a project for some years who might produce one or 2,000 tons. You've got Fortune Metals. You've got First Cobalt in Canada. You've got a couple of projects uh, proposed by Robert Friedlander in Australia, again, all of which are relatively small tonnages and which aren't going to change the overall picture of cobalt availability and demand. The, the project in Australia by the Royal Print is called Clean Tech. Nick, if there's no price that will justify more production, and at the same yes. time, the end user, being a battery manufacturer, are price insensitive in many ways. They need the cobalt at this point, and they're able to pay for it. Then what caps a potential cobalt price, or what's the point of the cobalt price going up to a certain point? Well, I think, I think the long term, which by which I mean certainly something over 10 years, is impossible to predict. But I think in the next five years, almost nothing caps it. I don't want to sound too dramatic, but let, let me just give you a picture. At the moment, uh, batteries represent about 50, or chemicals and batteries represent about 50% of the world's cobalt demand, which is give or take 100,000 tons a year. Uh, before we look to what might happen in batteries, you might look at the other uses of cobalt and say, well, maybe there's some thrifting there. Maybe we can cut back on what is uh, used by the other users as the price goes up. I should point out that uh, cobalt, again, $30 a pound at the moment, was up in the 50s in 2008. That already promoted the thrifting wherever possible of cobalt usage in pigments, in steel, uh, and in some of the uh, other chemical uses. But one of the main other uses for cobalt is the super alloy world, that's to say the, uh, the blades for jet engines, for commercial and military uh, planes, jet engines, for uh, medical implants, hip replacements, knee replacements. All, all of those uh, uses represent about 25% of the world's demand for cobalt. And that usage in itself is, is increasing at about 6% per annum. So if the price does go up, which we suspect it will, there isn't any give in the other uses uh, that will enable one user to sacrifice their needs and give it up for the battery usage. And I think as you go about it, one of the things that may happen, obviously, as the cobalt market gets tighter, is that new players come into the field. And by that, I'm thinking specifically the automakers. I think they've recently realized, and, and again, I, uh, you've seen some of the figures, uh, we expect 8 to 9% penetration of electric vehicles by 2025, i.e. 8 or 9% of vehicles sold that year will be uh, electric or hybrid. Um, VW themselves, who are obviously still trying to make good after their dieselgate scandal, the say themselves will be producing uh, you know, 25% uh, penetration by that time. And that means that these large car makers absolutely have to have the batteries and hence the cobalt to go in the batteries and pretty well without limit uh, need to do whatever is necessary to obtain it. VW recently entered into the market rather clumsy looking for a very large quantity over the next five years and were rebuffed by all the suppliers. So they're going to have to think through the, their strategy again. Now there's one dramatic scenario that says you know the capacity of batteries required will be greater than the cobalt available. So then it'll be a battle for survival between the large automakers who will look for supply partnerships and some will survive and some who may not get their cobalt strategy to correct uh, may find their future rather difficult. Um, and the most dramatic scenario, and that is the most dramatic we can think of, is where one car maker uh, effectively has a preemptive strike for, uh, for its cobalt business. It could be something dramatic like approaching a producer and buying them or even in the most extreme case, striking a deal with Glencore, who, as I mentioned, are the largest um, dealer, supplier, producer of cobalt, uh, and buying the whole cobalt business from them for the protection. It could be VW, it could be BMW, it could be Volvo, it could be one of the large Chinese groups who uh, are thriving at the moment and looking for the cobalt. Nick, we've had Mike back on the program on a couple occasions, and he's talked about the, his three favorite battery metals being lithium, nickel, and cobalt. In the case of lithium yeah. and nickel, he has said that based on discussions with experts, there's absolutely no replacement for those two uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. There's no other technology that can come into play and remove the need for those two if EV adoption happens at the rate people are expecting. 
Does that same thing apply for cobalt? Is there any replacement that could fit? Yes, uh, as, as far as I, I'm not a battery expert myself, but obviously I spend a lot of time talking to people who are these days in order to try and assess that, the answer to that very important question. And the answer I'm being given is clear, which is within the next five to 10 years, there is no uh, alternative to the essential lithium ion battery formula, which is to say it will contain nickel, manganese, and cobalt. The only thing that can change, and that, by the way, is the combination of both the power and the safety that that provides. The only thing that can change are the proportions of nickel, manganese, and cobalt therein. So, for example, if we're looking now at essentially at 622, six parts nickel for two manganese and two cobalt, um, they may be able to produce soon an 811, i.e. eight nickel, one manganese, one cobalt. Now, you might say, well, that's going to need you know, half as much cobalt. All true. The trouble is we need 10 times as many batteries. I picked 10 just as a number for easy mass. You're still going to need five times as much cobalt. And I think uh, the idea that people are going to change or try changing the technology prematurely reminds one of the experience Samsung had last year, I think it was, when they did try to change the technology uh, to save on some of the costs of the ingredients. And they had the case of the exploding uh, uh, you know, smartphones where Samsung telephones were not even allowed on board a, a plane for the danger. Yeah, I think it cost them $15 billion to put that right. So people are going to move slowly. And frankly, as long as people can access cobalt, and we're now talking about availability being the issue rather than price, then um, why would they want to take the risk of rushing technology for something that already works? Um, so I think, no, the answer is within the next five years, uh, no change in technology. I think one of the uh, indicators to that effect was that Umicor, who are Europe's largest uh, battery materials producer, a large Belgian industrial chemical company, recently announced uh, a commitment to an investment of 400 million euros to increase the capacity of their plant to make uh, NMC battery parts, to increase that capacity, by the way, by 600%, not to double it, but to, to increase it by six times using that technology. They obviously know more about battery technology than, than you and I, Colin, and they've shown by the, 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 their investment what they believe is going to happen. By the way, just to give you a scale of things, uh, of what's going on out there in terms of growth, I noticed today, it was news fresh literally today, that CATL, who are China's pretty much the largest battery parts producer, have just announced an IPO for $2 billion dollars to build two new uh, uh, electric vehicle battery plants in China. So that, that's the scale of things that is happening day by day at the moment. Nick, in terms of the cobalt market right now, we're looking at about 100,000 tons per annum. What does that compare to past production, say, over the last couple decades? Has it held consistent? And are there more mines going into production at this point um, that plan to increase that amount over the next few years? Okay, uh, let's separate that if I may into two questions. No, um, when I first came into the cobalt business in the late 70s, cobalt world was about 20,000 tons, or if I take you back even to the beginning of this, this century, the year 2000, cobalt production then was only about 60 or 70,000 tons. So this thing is, is growing quickly. And you might extrapolate outwards and say, okay, well, if, if it's growing, how come it isn't going to grow to meet the 180 or 200,000 tons we need by 2025? Uh, the answer is, and we discussed it briefly before, because it's a byproduct and because it comes out of a copper or a nickel project and because the prices of both of those have been historically low recently and nobody's putting money on the table to open those up, there's always a lead lag in the time between the capex being uh, cleared for spending and when the mine comes into production, you might call it five or six years. So we know that in the next five or six years, nothing new that isn't already on the radar is suddenly going to appear in the form of new cobalt. What is on the radar are two projects, and they're well underway. One is Glencore's Katanga project in Congo, which is due to produce in the form of cobalt hydroxide, uh, is, is due to produce about 20,000, potentially up to 30,000 tons a year, ramping up from the end of 2018. And the other project, also in Congo, is a project called RTR, owned by the ERG Group, which again, the form of cobalt hydroxide is, is proposing to produce up to 15,000 tons a year in phase one and eventually maybe 20,000 tons a year, again, ramping up from the end of next year. Now, in both cases, I've no reason to believe that they won't eventually work. Uh, although, as I said earlier on, they are both um, in the hands of the logistics of Congo, which are never easy. Uh, this is the example I gave you of the figures out of Glencore a few minutes ago. 
But if you add those two sums together, let's call it 20 and 15 or 30, uh, 15 or 20, I think, when you could have come up with 40, 45,000, that takes us to 140, 145,000 over the next few years, by which time we're told, and it depends whether you're looking at the CRU figures or the Bernstein figures or some very good notes out from UBS and Credit Suisse on, on the subject, but everybody agrees, they may have different numbers, but everybody agrees the shortage by 2025 where the demand could be anything from 170 up to 200,000 tons a year. So uh, there is nothing in the short term, by which I mean five years, that can come to our rescue in terms of any large quantities of cobalt production. Nick, how about any above ground reserves held by maybe producers or governments that can cushion demand in the case of extreme need? Does any of that exist that you know of? Well, uh, yes and no, which is to say they do exist, but I don't think they're going to cushion that demand. And by that, I mean one of them is the Chinese government that have a national stockpile, which as far as the uh, data is available to us, consists of about 5,000 tons of metal, but they're not going to be releasing that back into the free market. Obviously, the reason for which they bought it is the reason for which it will be used, which is to protect Chinese requirements in the strategic world of, of uh, economic dominance, dare one say. So that wouldn't be coming back. Producers, for the most part these days, are driven by accountants, God bless them, and the accountant's job is to make sure that cash flow is positive all the time, so the producers are selling and delivering and collecting the cash for everything they produce as fast as possible. There is, and you mentioned in the introduction that I, I'm a, an advisor to a company called Cobalt 27, which uh, does have a stock at the moment. It's all on, on record and online. We have 2,160 tons, and that may increase in, in months to come. Uh, that obviously is different from the new projects that are going to be uh, digging up from underground in the sense that it is a material that is already above ground, in warehouse, exists, has been audited, and gets rid of the logistics of uh, either handling the material physically or any exposure to the politics, etc. of DRC, and therefore offers any investors that are interested in this theme and in this space a pure cobalt play by... Uh, effectively acting as an index to the EV story via the batteries and the cobalt they're in. Excellent. Well, Nick, I'm sure that there are going to be a host of questions from listeners that I did not think to ask on this discussion, so hopefully you're up for uh, a follow-up discussion at some point. It's been an absolute pleasure getting on. Before I let you go, um, thank you for sharing yeah. the info on Cobalt 27 and a couple other names. Is there anywhere else as an investor really looking to capitalize off this cobalt shortage that you might look to, or are the choices that limited? I think the choices are limited. There are obviously uh, producers, who, uh, public companies who are producers of cobalt, amongst other things, uh, to mention just a couple, but there are more than two. You know, share it, big Canadian company, but of course their, pri their share price is driven by nickel rather than by cobalt. Glencore uh, effectively handle and produce 25% of the world's cobalt, but Glencore being such a large and successful company, uh, you know, I believe it's only, cobalt represents only 8% of their EBITDA at the moment. If you listen to Ivan Glasenberg, he's very positive on cobalt. But it's not a direct and pure geared play on cobalt. Uh, you're also betting on the success of Glencore in all the other fields it's involved in. So there are limited uh, possibilities. And as we move towards the cobalt cliff, there's no doubt about it at all, uh, as we've noticed that the financial world of, of hedge funds, investment banks, whatever, are uh, very keen to find a properly geared way into this space. So hopefully Cobalt 27 can offer them that. Nick, thank you so much for coming on the program today. As I said, hopefully we get you back here soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?